Hello everyone and welcome to Unbox the Podcast, the podcast that helps you live your best life. I was listening to the podcast I recorded last week and it felt to me as though I've rushed through it and I've presented it in a very civilized way. The invasion took place and then I started sensing things, but it wasn't like that at all. It was the most confusing yet interesting time of my life. I think you'd you'd better grab your cup of coffee or tea. This podcast might be a long one. Um, It's funny how memory works. I'm just producing this podcast series about my transition from corporate life to mystical spiritual life. Brought a lot of memories, but also it's a time of reflection for me. You know, what is what was this journey about? Where is it heading? Which is the most important question. It was a confusing time. It was a traumatic time. And it was particularly confusing because everything has ended. Everything has ended literally overnight. And it was a profound change that I and my siblings weren't prepared for. Maybe my parents have been. In a way, they always felt life was unstable because of the traumatic, the traumas that they went to, they went through in the past. Because of wars, invasions, etc., they moved countries and so on like five times in their lifetime. And they had to restart again. So when we speak of generational trauma, perhaps that trickled through to my generation, to my siblings and, and people who are of my generation. The change was profound because it was sudden and everything that is familiar has shifted. And like being in a storm, the landscape is changing. Everything is being thrown around you. You're in a whirlpool and you don't know which way to turn or where things would settle down. And for a few days, they were really shocked. And they said, no, 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 this is not going to last. Just a quibble between two brothers, it will settle down. But deep inside, I knew that it wouldn't. I don't know how I knew. There was just a very clear sense of knowing. I found an old poem that I want to share with you that I wrote once I got out. And the only persistent thought was, make your way to London, make your way to London. I don't know why London. And I remember even arguing with my brother. I said, I need to go to London. I need to get out. And he said, how are you going to do that? How are you going to manage that? Because everything was shut. The, um, the currency has deflated, like it was worth nothing. There was no income. Everything closed down. Everything was in a state of suspension, if you can imagine, as there would be in a war. And it was just impossible to see the way out. What I was also thinking about is that literally the night before, we had a corporate event. And part of the event, we had an astrologer, an Indian astrologer, which I thought was really interesting. And I think the company we had about, I don't know, 45 employees. So, you know, he was reading the charts for everyone. And one of the things he told me that you will stop working suddenly and you will never work again in your life. And I thought, what What is he talking about? I was doing really well. And I was in a relationship at the time. And he said, if you don't get married now, you won't get married until you're 44. And I thought, what? So these two things stuck in my mind. And when this invasion took place, I asked my my friends at work, you know, have you been told anything? Has any of that been foreseen? When you have an event that is global, it does show up whether you do the cards or do whatever it is. But but there was nothing. There was no preparation. There was no mention of it. You know, everything was hunky-dory. And then we woke up uh, to this war and the invasion. And this is really what got me thinking about who knows the future? How can you tell the future? And this is when my cousin said, go and have a reading. And I said, what's that? How can a set of cards tell you what your future is? So these are the things that propelled me on that journey because it seemed to me if I am if I can be in charge of my own life then the rest will sort itself out so how do you become in charge of your own life this is where I'm coming from in in my work as an intuitive as a healer even as a life mentor I combine these dimensions together because unless you bring everything together into alignment you don't know where you're going Just to give you an idea of what it was like that day when I woke up and my nightmare unfolded exactly as I had dreamt, this stunned me. I mean, in every detail, it unfolded exactly as I I had dreamt um, the night before. I called this poem Instant Replay. There were two bangs on the door just before dawn, violent, persistent explosions. 
They're coming in. They're forcing their way in. The BBC World Service winced and I yelled, stock up on water and gasoline, stock up on water and gasoline. We're being walled in. Father suddenly remembered his cargo was on its way to the borders. He left to save his fortune before it was too late. But he was too late. Mother and sister went after him, scuds exploding on either sides with heavy black smoke to guide them to Kuwait City. Then my brother walked in, looked at my blank face and gave instructions to bolt the gate while he traced everyone. The house was now empty. All I could do was wait and pace in front of the mirror. I caught my reflection. I must have aged a generation. Suddenly, after a few hours, they all walked in, dumbfounded, shocked, all of them. There were no words to exchange. An embrace instinctively took place to endure what's to come. Ya Latif, Ya Latif. And it was really like that. And having read this poem, I'm, I'm, I've been recently <laughs> decluttering and I found it and I remembered because I forgot that my mother and my sister left and I was all alone at home because they had to change my father. And by, by the time my father made it, my brother made it from his house to our house, he's like, where's everyone? And I said, you know, they went to look after my dad and, and he went to look after them and they disappeared all day until they got back. And it was the longest day of my life. And when they all walked in, I promise you, they had aged and their hair just shot gray. And I just looked at our reflection in the mirror and I thought, oh my God, you know, brace yourselves. We're going to be here for a while. What also happened is expatriates were being gathered as, as a wall, you know, as a humanitarian shield. And my brother had a colleague, an Englishman, and he went to his house to try and pick him up and take him to the British embassy, but he couldn't find him. And he got really, really worried. And he came back into our house and he was really concerned. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, I'm looking for Richard and I can't find him. And suddenly, like a portal opened up in front of me. It's like as if you're watching a projection of a movie. And I said, Richard is hiding in the AC vent. Look there. And he just looked at me like, what? Are you crazy? I said, just go and look. And he did. And he did find Richard there. And he delivered him to the embassy. And he got safely out. And when I went to England, after a few months, when I managed to get to England, Richard heard. And we met for the first time. And it was just a, a, a beautiful, really, a meeting. And thank God for this, whatever, intuition. I don't know what to call it. It was more of a like something, a clip that happened. I watched it and I just told my brother to go and look for him there and he's there and, and his life was saved. So I thought too many things were happening. But as far as this, I thought as far as my intuition unfolding, I thought, mm, that's interesting. If it can help, if it can be for help for others, then okay, why not? And I really didn't think much more in terms of it being a dramatic unfolding saga because it wasn't like so dramatic. I don't know what I felt. I just felt, okay, well, it's natural. It's possible to see this. And I haven't really thought of the mechanics. And I thought that everyone has this. And maybe that's why people are not talking about it because everyone has the same thing. And I thought, okay. And I just, you know, got on with it. But the thing is, when you receive inspirational guidance, it is so persistent. It's kind of like a thought that penetrates your own thinking so you can't ignore it. So if I can describe this a little bit better, when you're thinking and analyzing, it's almost like you're projecting what you know. But when it's inspirational guidance, you received it as a satellite would. So that it's directional, if you will. Your thoughts you project, like a TV, you transmit. But intuition, it's, it's transmission you receive. <laughs> It's kind of like, you know, satellite is transmitting something and your TV is receiving it. And um, it was interesting for me because I wasn't prepared for that. But I also wasn't scared. And I don't know why I wasn't scared. It was just so interesting. Like, what is this about? Where is it coming from? And it gets more interesting because when you work as a therapist, as um, a spiritual therapist, meaning non-denominational, you're there to help people who need help. And I wanted to help people and guide them because having left that life, 
the landscape, as I said earlier, was so confusing and I didn't know which direction to go. And the advice that people gave me was really irrelevant because they were talking on a much lower level and it wasn't from the perspective of, okay, this is what your life about and this is what you need to do in, in order to prepare for the next phase of your life. I guess most people wouldn't think that way, but this is what I needed deep within me. What is my track? You know, why did I study this and then study that and then started the job in this? And then now all of that is suddenly over. Then what am I supposed to, which way am I supposed to turn? And this is when I found seeking guidance was to be helpful because nothing made sense except what Marin said. And she said, trust your intuition. And one of the things she also said is that you're not going back to a normal career. You'll be helping other people. And it was the weight of such a thing was so heavy on me because it's such a big responsibility. So if I was out of alignment or traumatized, I I wouldn't see a client. It's not fair because as a vessel, you're not clear enough to guide others. And the other thing is you have such a responsibility to walk your talk. If I, if my life wasn't clear, if I wasn't moving in a clear direction, how can I guide you? So in a way, it shaped my own life journey. And I, as I interacted with clients, they also helped shape my journey because they were asking me very profound questions and I had to find the answer. And this is where the self-growth took. But I listened to Marin and she said, do this course, I did. Do that course, I did. And Tara was the greatest thing because it opened up so many doors. And I'm a curious person. (laughs) And I took time out for a time. I lived in the British Museum. I researched ancient civilization. I just satisfied all that curiosity that when you work, you don't have the time to work on yourself. And I really learned something that you don't stop growing or learning just because you leave college. You know, once we graduate, most of us would focus on a career and then we forget our personal growth. But it really isn't so. And and your growth needs to be holistic. You need to grow creatively. You need to grow artistically. You need to grow intellectually. You, you need to grow in every way. And especially with technology, we mustn't really shy away from it because it is the way of communication and you are being left out if you don't. And I was so impressed with my cousins who were like, you know, 20, 30 years older, and they didn't shy away from computer or the internet or starting an email. Even mom, mom was in her 80s when she said, I I want to have an email. (laughs) So I set up an email for her. And we were talking over Skype when I was in London. And, you know, bless her soul. I love that about her. I love that about every person who is not afraid to cross that barrier and to stay curious and interested in life. And I think this is the thing that helped me. Um, Often my clients will tell me, oh, you're so inspiring, you're so resilient, you're so strong. It isn't really strength. I have no strength, but I have conviction. I would describe conviction as when your heart and mind say the same thing, then that is conviction. And to me, that is what seems to mobilize me. That is what charges me, fuels me to cross the boundary, to take the next step, to keep moving forward. So there's nothing really magical. You have to understand what is your own dynamic, what motivates you, what is your intention, and what is the incentive behind your intention. And if your incentive and intention are in alignment, then you will move and you will naturally do the right thing. A lot of people kind of like, force themselves. For me, it doesn't work. Kind of like energy, you know, if you if you have water, it always travels easily from a high place to a lower place. So no effort is needed. The same thing with motivation. Your energy, your, your inspiration will flow easily if you are in alignment with what is in your heart deep down. But if you're motivating yourself for the wrong reason, like, I don't want to give examples to judge anyone, but if, if your motivation is, let's say, an ego-based thing, it's really not going to work and you're going to be really, really tired. But if your motivation is something that will help, I don't know, your people, your tribe, humanity at large, you will find that the whole universe <laughs> will move to help you get it. So... All of these things I explored or I was 
encouraged or forced, if you will, to explore in the last 30 years because I was trying to make sense of my own life. And every time I crossed a bridge, it seemed like, oh my God, there's another one looming on the horizon. And I applied the same thing, really. What is my intention? What is my incentive? Am I really passionate about this? Why am I doing it? What are my reasons? And they were always about something that was within me rather than without. I hope that makes sense to you. So when you when you are like that, when you are in such a job and when this is your path that you have to deal with the humanity at large and it doesn't matter where people come from, what nationality or religion they are, then how do you cope when people... Most people, I would say, 80% are unawakened, maybe. I don't know. This is what they say. Like, there's a 20-80 rule. And when they're not, but then you're being challenged. So I had a lot of people from different walks of life. And I remember this Israeli woman that came to see me in London. And she was referred to by another Jewish um, uh, acquaintance. And actually, we became friends of mine. And I wrote a poem about it. So this is like just one of the complexities that I had to go through, that I went through, not had to go through, but I went through to investigate, you know, who am I and what is my identity? I called the poem Israeli Israeli. We chatted for a while, a mutual friend arranged for us to meet. She relaxed, pondered, sipped at her tea. Until the last drop, then she asked me, where do you come from? I'm Palestinian, said me. Oh, God, gasped she. What do you mean? I asked carefully. I'm Israeli, declared she. I know, I have many Jewish friends, said me. Yes, she is Jewish, you see, unlike me. I am Israeli, Israeli. She's just Jewish. By now, her new expensive shoes were really killing her. She asked if I minded her taking them off. Any last words of wisdom, she said. Put them in the freezer, I said. She raised an eyebrow. I just smiled. So when you belong to humanity, you belong to humanity. It becomes very difficult to set yourself apart. Yet, as human beings, we're very complex. We go through a lot of these emotions, and we're always trying to define who we are unconsciously by our heritage, our lineage, where we come from. But there are challenges of integrating who you are as a person, what I call personality, and who you are as a soul or as a spirit. And this identity thing I explored in my 30s. Actually, I wrote a poem called I Do or I Don't. I'll try and find it. And a lot of the trauma, perhaps, as I look at my poetry, was released by the trauma of this invasion. So channeling it through creativity worked for me. And this is one of the things, the force is so immense. But instead of turning it to anger, transmute it, which you can. The poem I called I D or I Don't. Who am I? Where is this life leading me? High fever, maybe. But the wedding must go on. Death beating, dirabik, 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 da. Spiritual ritual that's moving, henna night. Tattooed, tender fingers, is she ready, the bride? The daf goes on beating, dirabit, 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 da. A musician playing electric guitar in a galabia. And I'm crying out in solitude between the changing of the masks. Who am I? Where do I belong? The dervishes go on spinning, tirabit, tirabit, tra-la-la. So, I don't know, was that in meditation? Most of the time, these poems or inspirations came through meditation. And we have to find, for me, we had to find an identity beyond the personality, beyond the heritage, beyond the cladding that we came in. I think only then do you feel that you belong to your life, to the cosmos, to... um, to the plan that whatever force God you believe in has for you. I don't think we can have boundaries anymore, but we have to keep that thin line between what's right and what's wrong. And and very often it's a very difficult one because it's a decision that you relate to personally in a way that relates to your genetic inheritance. I can't repeat that, so think about it and rewind this. So I'm saying most of the decisions 
that we make are based on the boxes that we put ourselves in. And later on, that kind of thinking helped me name my brand because after my um, mother and my beloved husband passed away, I just didn't know what am I supposed to do. And I was sitting in the garden and I was looking at this bush that was growing really nicely and then it split into two and half of it was dead, really dead. And the other half was growing and I looked at it and I thought oh my God, you know, the half is dying to allow the other half to grow. And in a way, my brain made the connection. And I thought, okay, maybe they've passed on because I need to forge my own way. And to come out of that box, I was identifying myself as a daughter, as a wife, and then both of these are gone. So who am I and what am I supposed to be doing with my life? So I'm looking for the poem about identity. I think I wrote another one. Oh, here it is. That was a few years later. And I called it at 33, 11, 30 p.m. I don't know why inspiration seems to come like really for me in the late hours of the night, perhaps when it's more quiet. And I remember Marin, my former teacher and friend, said, Sarah, it'll be really funny. When are you going to see clients at night? But there was such clarity at night, even during the invasion. It was absolutely incredible. It's like I could listen in and, and pick up whatever inspiration or guidance or even think. Parts of me are old and sad, but don't analyze It goes back to when the atom split. Parts of me are pinned to the earth. Parts of me fly with the wind. Parts of me are forever traveling Badawiya. Parts of me are refuge for others. Parts of me are a middle age gypsy. Parts of me are modern poet on the web. Parts of me form a rainbow and the rest of me is a woman's struggle to be born. It's a little bit harder in the Arabian culture for a woman perhaps than a man or even the Eastern culture because having a role model is so important and your options are limited in a way because you're just expected to get married, have children, get on with your life. (laughs) And having lost my father in my 30s was a friend asked me, was it expected? And that made me stop and think, was it expected? You never really expect to lose a child or a parent, regardless of their age, because you expect to grow together, make more memories. That's really that emotional link that I found very hard to deal with. Logically, I understand people get older, they pass. But still, when it happens, when you feel I haven't had enough time to spend with them, and we had a great childhood, I had a great family, my immediate family. So it was What kept me going is this emotional bond and to lose one of the tethers that pinned me to the ground was to pin me in my life was very, very hard. So that dream, the nightmare, emotionally prepared me for the drama, the trauma that was coming. And it gave me these fascinating glimpses. You know, I would see things, hear things, feel things. And in the middle of that nightmare, Dawn was trying to emerge, and that was not easy because that dawn, the coming dawn, as they say, the last hour before the dawn, still was unclear. There was a lot of what-ifs that you had to overcome. You don't know what you want to build. But I think every transition is like that. Every few years for me was like that. And my cycle was 12 years. And then I found out, oh, how interesting, because Jupiter rules my sign and Jupiter has a cycle of 12 years and then you know the circle of curiosity that I needed to satisfy began to expand and expand even more and I realized a transition is a transition a transition is different from a change because there are cycles within cycles Um, so a change is you moving homes changing jobs a transition is when the total landscape changes when you become a mother you are no longer an individual When you leave that job and retire, what happens then? What are you going to create? What is your life about? Beyond the definition of a job, that is a transition. When everything changes suddenly, 180 degrees, that is a transition. And a lot of these transitions are depicted in the tarot. I mean, you'd think, like, this is silly. How can a set of cards do that? But for me, it was more than that. It was a creative journey. It was somebody thought about this and someone thought that these images might help someone else. And and they depicted that journey and they made the difference in the tarot between transitions and change. 
And I just began to look into all of it. And it's been really incredible. And I think maybe I overloaded you this time. So I would love to spend this time with you again next Tuesday. Do let me know what you think. And do let me know if you're enjoying this or not, because it's so hard to sit here and speak into a mic. And I don't know who you are, but thank you. Thank you for downloading and listening to my podcast. Take care and have a great week.